So we've been talking about least squares problems for a while now. What I'd like to do now is talk about a class of iterative methods for solving least squares that can be particularly useful when dealing with large scale problems. So first recall that if A is full column rank, then we have a simple formula for the least square solution. It's A transpose A inverse times A transpose Y. Now we're in the setting here where A is an M by N matrix and M is greater than N. So what are the big computational costs here? Well, first we need to compute A transpose A. So if A is M by N, then A transpose A is an N by N matrix. So we have n squared entries, and the cost of computing each of these entries is a length m inner product. So in general, this is going to cost us order m times n squared computations. And then once we have a transpose, we'll need to invert it, and that's going to generally cost us order n cubed computations. But note that if m is greater than n, it's actually the cost of just forming a transpose that might appear to dominate here. In either case, though, if n is large, these costs get very big. So just to give a concrete example with some real numbers here, we can think about the process involved in reconstructing an MRI. So this is a bit of an idealization, but you can think of a 3D MRI scan as basically computing a bunch of X-ray-like images at different orientations. And then each of these images give you some measurements and tell you something about the underlying image. And the process of reconstructing that full 3D scan boils down to solving a large least squares problem. So we can think of X as representing our image and we can model the measurements that we get as a times x, giving us this vector y. Now, what are the numbers involved here? So if x represents a 128 by 128 by 128 3D cube, then n here is on the order of 10 to the sixth. And then the number of measurements we're going to get are even greater than 10 to the sixth, so maybe as high as 10 to the seven. So mn squared here is something like 10 to the 19th. And when those kinds of values, even just storing a transpose in memory is going to take terabytes of RAM. Moreover, inverting it is going to be borderline impossible. So what we'll talk about today are some iterative algorithms that allow us to not have to worry about directly computing this inverse. And these can be very powerful when coupled with the fact that in many real world systems, applying A can actually be much cheaper than the cost of an arbitrary matrix vector multiplication. So in an MRI example, it turns out that the A matrix that models the MRI machine actually has a lot of structure. It's in fact based on the Fourier transform. And so we can apply A in under a second. And it turns out that an iterative algorithm them that just needs to iteratively apply A can solve this problem in under a minute. To see how this approach is going to work, first, let's remember that the least square solution, even though we have this formula for it, we derived it as the solution to this optimization problem, where we minimize over all x and rn the two norm squared of ax minus y. Well, if we just expand this out, we can also write this as an optimization problem where we're trying to minimize x transpose a transpose ax minus 2x transpose a transpose y plus y transpose y. This is just the expanded out form of this two norm above. And notice that y transpose y is the same for all values of x. So we can really just ignore this term when we're solving our optimization problem. And moreover, we can also just rescale this objective function that we're trying to minimize by a factor of one half just for convenience. And so an equivalent problem that we could be trying to solve is just minimize overall x one half x transpose a transpose AX minus X transpose A transpose Y. Finally, just to simplify our notation a little bit, I'm going to replace A transpose A with H and A transpose Y with B. So we have a slightly more compact representation. And so we have this simple optimization problem that we're trying to solve. And what we can do is apply a classic algorithm for iteratively minimizing a function like this called gradient descent. So the basic idea of gradient descent is quite simple. So we're trying to minimize some function f of x and f is convex. And we'll be more formal about what we mean by convexity later on in the course. For now, we can just think of convexity as meaning we have a bowl shaped function like this. And the idea in gradient descent is that we first pick an initial guess for what the solution might be. We could maybe just pick something at random and we'll call this x naught. And then we want to move in the direction of steepest descent. So we just want to kind of roll downhill. And as we mentioned previously in our review of multivariable calculus, the direction of steepest descent of a function is just the negative gradient of that function evaluated at that point. So we're going to denote this by minus the gradient with respect to x of f 
evaluated at x naught. So that's what this notation means here. And so when we write this out, what this is going to look like is we form x1 by just taking x naught, and then we move in the direction of the negative gradient, but we multiply this by this step size alpha naught. And in this 1D example over here, the slope is positive, and so taking a step in the direction of the negative gradient is going to move us backwards. And so we arrive at x1, and then we just repeat this process. So we form x2 by taking x1 and now taking a step in the direction of the negative gradient evaluated at x1. And we repeat this process iteratively until we arrive at some sort of convergence. So how does this work in the context of least squares? We'll recall that in least squares, our objective function f that we're going to be trying to minimize is 1 half x transpose hx minus x transpose b. And we know how to compute the gradient of this expression. You did it on the first homework. So the negative gradient of f evaluated xk is going to be minus the negative gradient of h of xk minus b. And then if we distribute the negative sign, we have b minus hxk. So notice that b minus hxk is actually easy to interpret. So recall that b represents a transpose y and h is our a transpose a matrix. So we're trying to actually find an x that makes hx equal to b. That's what the least square solution is going to look like. And so b minus hxk is telling us what part of b does x not quite explain yet. And for this reason, we call this the residual RK, just for shorthand. And with this notation in hand, the core gradient descent iteration is going to look like xk plus 1 is equal to xk plus alpha k times rk. And so we're just going to repeat this iteration over and over again. And that's really all there is to it, with one small caveat, which is we have to decide what this step size alpha k is. And as you'll see on the homework, the choice of alpha k can make a big difference in terms of how quickly this is going to converge. However, we're fortunate in the least squares case in that we can actually do something very intelligent to pick this alpha k. So Let's go back to our objective function. So we have f of xk plus 1. And xk plus 1, recall, is just xk plus alpha times rk. And the question is, how do we actually choose alpha to get the most bang for our buck? So we're going to be moving in the direction of rk. And what we'd like to do is ensure that f of xk plus 1 is as small as it could possibly be. But notice that this f of xk plus alpha times rk. Because f is a quadratic function, it turns out if we think of this just as being a function of alpha, it is a quadratic function of alpha. And alpha is just a single scalar here. And so if we want to find the choice of alpha that's going to give us the minimum value for f of xk plus 1, we can get this just by taking the derivative of this function with respect to alpha, and then setting it equal to zero, and that will allow us to solve for the optimal alpha. So let's do this. So if we just take the derivative with respect to alpha of f of xk plus 1. Well, using the chain rule, we can write this out as the gradient of f with respect to x evaluated at xk plus 1 transpose times the derivative of xk plus 1 with respect to alpha. So think of xk plus 1. Remember, this is a function of alpha. And notice two things here. So what is the derivative of xk plus 1 with respect to alpha? Well, it's just going to be r of k. And also, what is the gradient of f evaluated at xk plus 1? Well, that's just rk plus 1. And so if we want to set this equal to 0, we just want rk plus 1 transpose rk to be equal to 0. That's going to give us the optimal alpha. And to find the optimal alpha, we just need to plug in the fact that rk plus 1 here, this is actually a function of alpha. So if we go back and plug in for rk plus 1, we have rk plus 1 is actually b minus h times xk plus 1. And now remember that xk plus 1 is actually xk plus alpha k rk. And so if we plug that in, we get this nice long expression. And then we can distribute this inner product with rk amongst these terms. And first we have the terms that don't involve alpha k. We have b minus hxk transpose rk. And then we have a minus alpha k rk transpose h times rk. 
And so now we just recall that B minus H X K is actually R K. And then if we rearrange our terms, we have that the formula for the optimal alpha K is just going to be R K transpose R K divided by R K transpose H times R K. So if we put all this together, we have the following simple gradient descent based algorithm for solving a least squares problem. So first we just need to initialize with some X naught and R naught is just going to be B minus H times X naught. And we have an iteration counter k that we'll set to zero. And then we're going to have a while loop. And this is basically going to just check for convergence. So while the L2 norm of the residual is greater than epsilon, we're going to iteratively first calculate the optimal step size alpha k, then take a gradient step in the direction of rk, and then we'll update our residual with our new xk and update our iteration counter. And that's the whole algorithm. Now, in the notes, I present a clever improvement on this algorithm that lets you reduce the two matrix multiplications you have to do here to just a single matrix vector multiplication. And in practice, this might make a big difference if you're solving a big problem, but you can read further about that in the notes. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about how quickly we can expect this kind of algorithm to converge. So the overall effectiveness of gradient descent is going to depend really critically on the interaction between a couple of different factors. So one just has to do with how good of an initial guess you had. And part of that means how close your guess is to the actual solution. But it also has something to do with the position of x naught with respect to the overall shape of the quadratic function that we're trying to minimize here. So consider two different cases. So in the first case, I'm showing level sets of the function we're trying to minimize here. We have a nice spherically symmetric function that we're going to be trying to minimize. And then on the other hand, I'm going to consider a quadratic function where we have a somewhat more eccentric set of ellipses forming our level sets. So it's a little bit more squished. And these are actually very different cases. So in fact, in the first case, if we really do have perfectly circular contours, it turns out the gradient is always going to point directly towards the global minimum of the problem. So this actually corresponds to the case when the H matrix in our optimization is just the identity, in which case, if you think back to the least squares problem, we're trying to invert the identity. So there's actually nothing to do there. And it turns out the gradient descent works really well in this case. So the gradient will point directly in the spot that you need to go. And since we're taking the optimal step size and one step will get to the origin. In contrast, when we have this more eccentric ellipse, the result really depends on where x naught lies. So we might get lucky. So there are spots along this contour where the gradient is going to point towards the global minimum and we will converge very quickly. But most points that we might consider, the gradient is actually not going to be pointing towards the global minimum. And so what can happen here, especially if these ellipses get really squished, is that when you pick an initial guess, the gradient is not really pointing towards the minimum very well. And you end up zigzagging and hopping around and taking many, many iterations to converge. So you can quantify this in the case of least squares using something called the condition number. So the condition number of a matrix H, which is usually denoted by kappa, is just the ratio of the maximum to the minimum non-zero singular values of the matrix H. So if H is rank R, it's going to be sigma 1 over sigma R. So this told us a lot about how sensitive least squares was to noise, and it also tells us a lot about how hard a least squares problem is to solve using an iterative method like gradient descent. So in particular, this Spherically symmetric case corresponds to kappa being equal to one, where all the singular values are the same, as in the case of the identity. And this case on the right, where we have a more eccentric set of contours, this corresponds to the case where kappa is greater than one. And as kappa gets larger, the problem is going to get continually more difficult. Now, this is something we're going to revisit later on in the course, but you can actually get a nice convergence guarantee for gradient descent. And we'll prove this result later for general convex functions. Functions, but here I'm just going to state what the result looks like for least squares. So if x star denotes the actual optimal solution to our minimization problem that we're trying to solve, then what you can actually show is that xk plus 1 minus x star, so the error that we have at the k plus 1th iteration, we can actually bound this by a constant 
which in the least squares problem is the condition number of h minus one divided by the condition number plus one. And that constant is gonna then be multiplied by the norm of xk minus x star. So notice that this constant is somewhere between zero and one. So if kappa is relatively small, this constant can be quite a bit less than one. So say for instance, if kappa is equal to three, this constant is a half. And in such a case as this, we're making a lot of progress on each iteration. We're cutting the error in half at each iteration. So it's not hard to imagine that after a small number of iterations, we will have reduced our error to be as small as we want. Now, on the other hand, if kappa is very large, then this constant can be very close to one, which is saying we're not making a lot of progress on each iteration. Another way of viewing this is to actually ask the question of, well, suppose we want the two norm of xk minus x star to be less than epsilon times the two norm of x naught minus x star. So we want to cut our initial error by a factor of epsilon. You could say, well, how big does k need to be? How many iterations do we need to cut this error by a factor of epsilon? Well, it turns out, we go through the calculations in the notes, that the number of iterations needs to behave roughly like the condition number times some constant times log of one over epsilon. So this tells us two things. First of all, we can let epsilon be pretty small, and since we're just looking at log of one over epsilon, the number of iterations doesn't grow that much as we drive epsilon to be extremely small. However, we see that the number of iterations is gonna grow basically linearly with the condition number. And on the homework, you're gonna actually encounter some matrices that have quite large condition numbers. And what this is saying is that we will expect to need a very large number of iterations in this kind of a setting. All right, so this kind of wraps up our discussion of least squares. And next time we're gonna start talking about more general convex optimization problems. And we'll end up returning to gradient descent, but also talking about various other improvements and variants of this kind of approach.